some of the interpolations that have been added to Paul's authentic letters and later letters uh, that are attributed to Paul but are really not Paul and, and contradict you know, the very fact that he names um, a number of women apostles that he's working with and even planning his, his final trip to Spain with. Um, he lived and he died as a Jew, proudly a Jew. There's, I think, a popular notion that I certainly grew up with that he was the first convert to Christianity, and that's just not really borne out by the, by the facts. Um, and his, his uh, authentic writing about his experience of the risen Lord is the only first-hand account of an experience of, of the risen Lord, yeah. Um, and he wasn't an anti-Semite in spite of uh, him being attributed that role. So we'll talk a little bit about all those things. So the real Paul of the 13 letters or writings that are attributed to him, there are seven that scholars have consensus are authentic. So 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, Philippians, Philemon or Philemon, however you like to pronounce that, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans. Uh, and then there are a couple of other categories that scholars put the his writings, some that are written by followers that have some similarity of thought but not um, complete and, are, and sometimes at odds or have elements in them that post-date Paul's life. So he wouldn't have written it from the grave, we presume. Uh, Colossians, Ephesians, uh, one clumsy rewrite when you really compare the text to 2 Thessalonians, it borrows heavily from 1 Thessalonians. And then not at all from Paul's perspective, especially around women, um, but also because these writings, the, the pastoral epistles as they're called, include references to a church a hierarchy that didn't exist at the time of, of Paul uh, and were, would, would not have been pre-destruction uh, of the temple. So that, that's kind of a short summary of how scholars conclude what, what they think was authentically Paul and what wasn't. Um, is that pretty um, universally accepted? Among, among yeah, yeah, it's, it's probably in the 80 to 90 percent among, uh, you know, contemporary uh, scholars. I mean, there's some, there, there's more consensus around some than others, and, you know, there, there's arguments to be made about Ephesian Colossians that could say, well, it could have been that Paul chose to use different language. We use different language when we write to different people, but they contain some ideas and some other uh, elements that just suggest, like, probably somebody else and probably a little different, a little later. All the ones you listed that are pretty probably, pretty certainly not from Paul, the, are they attributed to Paul? Does it yeah. say? Does it say right in the beginning, "I Paul say you know uh, greet you" or whatever? A couple of them do, and others are just attributed to him, just okay. for the for the same reason. Well, the Book of Revelation is the last book to to be. It took him well into the four hundreds to decide if that was going to be in the canon or not, and the reason it got in was because, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> A lot of people <laughs> agree that it should be. Was that they said? Well, it was it was authored by John, so uh, John the Evangelist. Yeah, although that's not, it's, was, it's a different John. While he was clearly a different while he John. he was in jail and, and, and or whatever. If if it was, the, the the writer of John's Gospel, which is <laughs> written in very good Greek, forgot how to write when wrote <laughs> the uh, Revelation because the Greek the Greek's terrible. It's just it's really awkward and clumsy, yeah. and if you were if you were looking at it in a translation, a transliteration, you would think probably not written by the same person. Who is this guy? Very very <laughs> awkward. Plus, it's just crazy. The word love does not appear in the book of Revelation. The Greek word love, right? I mean, it's it's really a not so book, right? I mean, the the world gets destroyed seven times seven times over. Once it's destroyed, there's nothing left to destroy. What? what how? How do you keep doing this? It's just a euphemism for it. Really, got this. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really, really destroyed. Okay. Um, so I even I. So just a little bit of background. My interest in Paul really started about 30 years ago when I was doing a, a reading a conference class with a New Testament scholar at OSU, and he had me read. 
Christopher Stendhal's book, Paul Among Jews and Gentiles, and Alan Siegel's book, Paul the Convert, and kind of introduced me to the, the, the new thinking around Paul, and I've just been interested ever since in it, you know, partly because of you know, our history, our Western civilization's history with Christianity's relationship to Judaism and, and the atrocities for thousands of years. And just because it's it's pretty interesting to think, wow, we we've been we the Christian Church has been thinking this way for you know 1,800 years, and it's probably based on mistranslations and not right. Uh, so it was interesting to me to think about that. So um, just touching on a few of these things. Well, well, maybe the last thing to say is I originally titled this presentation when I first gave it about four or five years ago, Paul and the Jews. And I've since changed it to Paul the Jew, just to reinforce, you know, there's, there, he was not different than the Jews of his time. He was a Jew of his time. Uh, you know, one who, who would have um, recognized Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. So Paul's often been accused of being the father of Christian anti-Semitism. Did he call um, Jews Jesus killers? Um, and did he say that the Jews were cursed by God? Uh, with respect to Jesus killers, we know it was the rulers of the world that killed Jesus. The, the rulers of the world were the Romans, and they put Jesus to death by uh, a Roman method of, of um, execution. That's not, a, not, a, not a, your standard crucifixion on, yeah. on the roadside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember reading somewhere where there were hundreds of them. Thousands. All yeah, all yeah. mounted on crosses yeah. in some one place. I come see and, what's going to happen to you. And the carcasses <laughs> left to be a deterrent to uh, anyone should they cross the Roman Empire. Yeah, um, Paul suggests that the Jews killed the Lord and the prophets, which was a you know, uh, uh, which which you see on the lips in of the prophets and, and others in the Hebrew Bible. You know, it's a it's a, a euphemism for. Um, not paying heed to the voice of the prophets. Um, did God curse the Jews? In Romans 11, he says, far from it. In Galatians, those who act under the law are under a curse. So how do we reconcile, you know, and throughout the writings, we can find uh, places where Paul seems to you be rhetorically stating one position and then contradicting himself. Um, what do we make of this? Well, we, we, it, we've started a false starting point. If we think that Paul left Judaism to join, to start Christianity, it, it's anachronistic to even suggest there was an identifiable group of Christians at the time of Paul. Yeah, yeah. Right? The, the term didn't even occur, appear until early in the, in the um, second century in Syria. Um, there were really three factions or groups um, within Judaism at this time, prior to the destruction of the temple. Group one is Jews that did not see Jesus as the Messiah. There were Jews who saw Jesus as the Messiah, group two. And then group three were non-Jews, Gentiles, who uh, accepted Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. And most all of Paul's ministry was toward group three. And where you find group three, you typically find group two. Because the, the earliest Gentile uh, followers of the Messiah would have been what would have been called God-fearers. Uh, Gentiles that attached themselves to Jewish synagogues, especially throughout the diaspora. Uh, but uh, had, had already associated themselves to some degree uh, with uh, a Jewish community. And this was very common. We have archaeological evidence, um, kind of like the brass plaques we have in the back of the church where you get your name put down if you can contribute it to the stained glass windows or the mm -hmm. pipe organ or something. They have these steles, I think they're called, steely. Yeah. Stone thing. Stone, it's a stone. Like a monument. Yeah, yeah, and so there are lots of examples of where a uh, synagogue is dedicated and the donors to the construction of the synagogue are named, and oftentimes in the order of who gave the most. Not a surprise, right? We still do that. 
Uh, and a lot of times you see Gentile members of that community that, that gave money. And sometimes they're even city council members, right? So they're, they're well placed in the community. Um, but almost all of Paul's authentic letters, and even, and even Colossians and Ephesians, are really aimed at resolving disputes that are occurring in the community between group two and group three. Jews that see Jesus as the Messiah and Gentiles that see Jesus as the Messiah. And most of the energy is going into what does group three have to follow in terms of traditional Jewish practice in order to be included in this larger group. So the word right. Jewish is still is attributable to all of these communities even if they're believing in, in, in Christ as, yeah, yeah, as a Yeah, they would, have, they, would have, they would have considered themselves bona fide Jews. Yeah. yeah. And would, would have recognized would have recognized that, that Jesus was the fulfillment it's, it's of the a cultural, promise. at least a cultural community, continuing, if not a, a yeah. religious. Yeah, although quite Hellenized, quite Greek, because, you know, probably 250 years prior, the, the Hebrews, because people in the diaspora, Jews in the diaspora, weren't speaking Hebrew anymore. They were speaking Greek, like all mm -hmm. the members of the, okay. of the Roman Empire, uh, Greek Empire. Uh, they had translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, which is we know as the Septuagint. So the, the, the scriptures of these diaspora Jewish communities would have been the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament or Greek Hebrew Bible. That, and Greek Hebrew Bible, that sounds like an oxymoron. But, uh, but yeah, they, they, and so the Gentile members of these communities would hear in Greek, all of the stories of the people of Israel. Stories of Abraham, stories of the patriarchs, stories of the flood, stories of the, the bondage in, uh, in Egypt, the story of exile, you know, that would have been familiar to them. And they were very attractive. These were popular. I was, it's done a little bit of research on this, but it's surprisingly, to me anyway, that the, the, the God-fearers made up such a significant portion of the, of the population of, the, of these synagogues. Um, and so they would have been naturally very attractive. Uh, they'd be, they would have been attracted to the notion of Jesus as the Messiah because in Paul's telling of, of the expectation for the end times and the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's promise made to Abraham, they would have been included. They would have been a part of the community without, you know, <clears throat> men having to get circumcised or, you know, following some of the other um, Jewish practices. So if you remember in most of the uh, the book of Acts, it, a lot of that is about the friction between, you know, the do, do you eat food sacrificed to idols or not, and, you know, how far do you go in the Jewish practices. And, Similarly, in Paul's own authentic writings, it's, it's resolving those kind of really practical community uh, issues. Uh, so when, in Paul's writing, he's referring to the Jews, he's really pointing to the group two Jews, the Jews that are, um, that are accepting Jesus as the Messiah and are almost always a part of the communities to which he's writing, especially the book of Romans. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, There we go. So how can Paul attack the Jewish law? Well, he really doesn't. Um, we, we misread Romans if we think anachronistically that he's talking about the first group, the group one Jews that don't see Jesus as the Messiah and Christians. Uh, uh, it's, it's not, that's not the group that, that he's really uh, addressing. So we, we, if we don't have that context in mind, it's very easy to misread uh, Romans. And Romans is difficult to read because there's so much Greek rhetorical um, use in that. And, and the way our um, um, Bibles are written and the way we kind of curate the reading of them, like this morning, right? The, was it a Galatians text this morning, I think? Um, you know, there's no context. For that right there's 
This was written to a community having issues. So what is, what is Paul really getting at when he's talking about you know, whatever was in that lesson? Um, and in the case of Romans, the main point is the reconciliation of a community that was comprised of group two Jews and group three Gentiles. So the group had been split apart um, because, and I mean, I get the emperor right, I can't remember if it was Nero, um, but there was a kerfuffle within the group, and uh, I think it was Tacitus at the time that wrote, it was over some character named Crestus, which is very likely a misquote of Christos, right, the Greek word for the Messiah or anointed one. And the emperor said, all right, Jews out, you leave, you leave Jerusalem. And that was in, I think, 49. And then, I want to say it was in the early, mid-50s, maybe, that a new emperor uh, is in power and allows this community back in. So now this community of Gentile believers and Jewish believers is sort of reunited, but there's some friction. And so Paul's letter to the Romans is really addressed at trying to bring that community um, together. Uh, so that, that, that's the, the fundamental purpose of the letter, and it's where he probably is most complete in how he's explaining the relationship between these two groups of Jews, uh, Jews and, and Gentiles. Um, and he uses some pretty, pretty cool rhetorical techniques. I mean, Paul was very versed, had a, probably had a great education, and you know, was probably the most educated uh, uh, writer of any of the New Testament uh, material. Um, where we put the chapter in verse breaks makes a big difference. The earliest manuscripts had no punctuation and no spaces between the words. And if you were a student of Greek, when you were learning, you had to actually go through a text and you had to discern, is this poetry? Is this prose? Is this some form of debate, diatribe, mm -hmm. uh, speech and character, these different kind of rhetorical techniques. Um, what a mess. I mean, you can't blame St. Augustine for not wanting to learn Greek. Not only that, they would beat him if he didn't do well enough, and he finally gave up and just went with Latin. But um, Somebody coined the phrase, it's Greek to me. <laughs> yeah. It's all Greek with no spaces and no punctuation. <laughs> um, chapters and verses were only added in the 13th century. Right, so, so that, that, yeah, that's way, way long later than anybody would have expected. Um, and where you put those breaks makes a difference. So from chapter 4 in Romans, where the chapter break occurs really obscures the rhetorical style. Not, not to mention it's just awkward to read. And you're reading along here and there's these questions that are appearing. Where's my, there's my pointer. So, you know... Um, then what becomes the boasting question? It is excluded. By what law? By that it works? No. By that, but who's asking the question and who's answering it? Mm -hmm. Right? What's 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 really happening here? It's a, it's, an, it's a narration of something that's happening over there. Kind of it's, like, it's, it's just a it's just a way to bring an idea to a table. I I, I have this so the, this letter was dispatched to Phoebe. To deliver to the Romans, and I and I can I close my eyes. And I picture her when you deliver it. You're actually reading this, right? And I'm picturing her standing up there, and when she gets to one of these rhetorical yeah, yeah. sections, she might stand here and ask the question, then like physically yeah. stand over here and answer, just to emphasize, okay, we've got a, a dialogue or a diatribe going on here, and the point of the question isn't because it was a real question, it was to emphasize the answer, right? So you set up this little kind of debate. Um, but in, in the NRSV, and I think probably almost every translation, you know, chapter 3 ends here, and our current way of thinking is, well, and we all learn how to write paragraphs in elementary school, right? A new paragraph starts with, you know, new, new thoughts and new paragraphs. So yeah. we would say, okay, Chapter four, that's got to be something new, right? So we, we finish here. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Just a continuation. End of thought. What then, are we say, what, what then would we say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? Now, there's a, a better way, I think, to look at this 
and and this this is the scholars version. This is a group of academics that put together their own version of the letters of Paul and and the Gospels, and they actually pull out when you get into the diatribe. They'll actually pull out and identify. Okay, this interlocutor, this this imaginary questioner, um, will 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 say this, and then Paul answers, and they they respect the ch the chapter and verse markings, but they also point out, you know, recognize that 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 the real conclusion of that rhetorical piece is way down here, not back here, where our minds are led to believe it would be if you're reading a, a standard translation. Um, but th this really brings out, you know, the fact that in this in this text this little kind of mini debate is going on to emphasize the point. So that that's you know something that Paul relies heavily on in Romans. So how can Paul attack the Jewish law? Well he really doesn't. In the beginning of Romans he tells the Jews, you know, you have the law that was given to Moses, and then he chastises the Gentiles because you you also got the law through nature and yet you ignored you ignored God's laws given through nature. So um, he contrasts those and, and says they're all a part of the single promise, the promise given by God to Abraham to be a father of many nations. I and mean, that's really the heart of Paul's theology is he understands what you call a prophetic eschatology, that the, the, the end times come when the promise to Abraham is fulfilled, and that's when the nations turn to the God of Israel. Not when they convert to Jews, become Jews, but when all the nations turn and recognize the God of Israel. So that's really Paul, what he, Paul feels like his mission is, right? That's why he's getting up a mission to head to Spain, because in the Mediterranean worldview, the end of the world is Spain, right? That's the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, and if you go back to the, to the Noah flood story, how many nations are there? There's... 71 nations or whatever it is, I can't remember the exact number, but uh, yeah, so so the whole world is comprised of, of course, the people of Israel and the nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles, the nations. So so Paul is, uh, is you know, emphasizing to the Gentiles, you, you are, by the by the faithfulness of Jesus, and by the promise to Abraham, you are now included. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how uh, does Paul attack the Jewish law? He doesn't. Uh, the Jewish tradition and the law talks about the delivery of the promised Messiah, and Paul's own language in Romans suggests that the Gentiles are grafted into the Jewish trunk. They become, uh, and we'll see it in just a slide here, honorary Jews, that's borrowing a term of Christopher Stendhal, a New Testament scholar. Um, but Paul goes on to point out that, you know, you can be grafted on, you can be pruned off, right? Original fruit or grafted on fruit, right? So, so no boasting, you Jews or you Gentiles. Um, Romans is not about individual souls, Dan. Paul is always addressing Groups of people, yeah, yeah. We we've you know sort of made it. Uh, you know, religion is like this individual. Um, he didn't write everything that's attributed to him, and I'll go through what what the consensus on scholarship is around that. Paul saw the thing. That's a very mo more modern uh, notion. Uh, Paul recognizes the end times uh, as addressing God's promise to the entire peoples, the entire world. The whole cosmos, actually, is the term Paul uses. Um, so how is this inclusiveness, how have we lost this inclusiveness? How is it misunderstood? Um, uh, that the conversion of the Jews must precede the end of the world? No. Um, and this is Christopher Stendhal. He was a uh, Harvard New Testament scholar. Actually, Dan knows him. He, he mentioned this at the first session this morning. Uh, he, he came and visited the seminary that Dan attended. Um, Christopher Stendhal, uh, Harvard New Testament professor and, and later bishop of Sweden, um, he, he's the one that wrote the first book that I studied in this reading and conference class, uh, 
Paul among Jews and Gentiles, which was a real uh, breakthrough in, in Pauline studies, because it's written in the late 70s, maybe. Um, no, his, his term is that the Gentile brothers are joined to the Jewish brothers as honorary Jews, or in Paul's own imagery, grafted onto the tree. Um, uh, another way this inclusiveness is most understood is that there's some sort of two-track rescue of humankind. No, Paul sees Jesus as the fulfillment of the Jewish promise to Abraham. Um, and I think that, I can't remember who I got the quote, that Jesus founded no new religion and Paul preached on. I think that was also Christopher Stendhal. Um, uh, you know, there, there, it, 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 God has one, one plan for the whole world. Um, I spent eight years attending a Lutheran church, so I had beat into my head uh, justification by faith, not by works of the law, and often fist pounding. I think went along with that. Um, and so, you know, that that's that's really what Paul's all about. No, um, he's really preaching about the fulfillment of this promise, um, and even Augustine, you know, who, who saw it, Paul's writing in Romans is more uh, addressed to individuals, and certainly Lutheran, Luther from a medieval church standpoint, um, and his own personal struggles trying to live up to whatever expectations he felt uh, from his monastic setting or he had for himself, uh, you know, saw this, this, this struggle between faith and works uh, and, and, and the abuses of the medieval church. That That's not really what what Paul's getting at either. Um, there's a raging, I don't know if you've had this, you're, you're in seminary, right? And I don't know if they have a, the, the Pistus Christu debate. No, there. we haven't got that. Okay, so faith in or faith of. Um, the word that we translate faith is pistis, uh, which means faith or trust or faithfulness or trustworthiness. Um, and in Galatians, um, we, we, we see it often translated as, uh, we know that a person is justified not by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, which is, you know, that's what I've heard my whole life, you know, until I read Christopher Stendhal. Um, but that, that actually, and it's even footnoted in the NRSV, uh, or the faith of Jesus Christ. And that's just a subtle, that's only a two-word, two-letter word difference. But it has a quite a different connotation. Sure does. Yeah. And if you, earlier in Galatians, when, when Paul is writing about the faith of Abraham that God identified as righteous, he, God declared Abraham righteous because of his faith, not because of any work that Abraham did, um, there's a pretty clear parallel to Jesus' faithfulness to God and God rewarding that faithfulness. Um, but this faith in Jesus uh, uh, has crept in, and it's been translated variously throughout um, a long time. Um, so if we just follow the kind of the English language train of translations and we go to the Tyndall Bible of 1525, that phrase was translated, Pistus Christu, is translated by the faith of Jesus Christ. And the Great Bible of 1539, same thing, same thing with the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Reims Bible, the King James Bible. Okay, now we're really starting to, to trace our own uh, biblical li translation lineage, right? Because we go from the King James to the Revised Version. Whoops! What happened in 1881? That that translation chose the faith in Jesus Christ. And we, we paused this morning with the group to, to wonder what, what was happening culturally or within the church at the time that would have suggested you would make that different translation where, you know, for, for 300 years prior to that, yeah. you, you had this other translation. All, all the, the other nice version kind of had a different... Back to back. All the other Bibles that you list 
you know, there, each one is influenced by the prior one, I suppose, yeah. to some yeah. degree. And yeah. then there's a 300-year, hmm, maybe we ought to think about this <laughs> more often. The, re uh, the revised version had its history more in uh, Geneva, I think, and uh, the, the Protestants, apart from the track we're seeing here, which is more English, I, I suppose, yeah. to some degree. Yeah. Although there's Geneva Bible up there. But, yeah. But there is different. There's there's a different strain of translation that you're following between King James and the Revised Version. If it if goes from RB of, is, excuse me, I'm sorry. If it goes from of to in, this kind of says everything prior to Jesus doesn't count anymore. We've got to have faith in Jesus, not in of the faith of, Ab uh, of what Abraham promised and what God mm -hmm. promised and what was promised in Noah and all, the, all that Old Testament stuff. So it sort of says, forget the Old Testament. You yeah. know, cry, focus on Christ only. Yeah. The, the I mean, that's, that's my first thinking about what, 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 not what happened in 300 years, that gap. But, um, well, that, that, in a way, it happened, and it does change things. Yeah, does Jesus, does Jesus' faithfulness render us righteous in right relationship with God, or does our faith in Jesus yeah. bring about yeah. God's righteousness? Is it our doing or Jesus' right. doing? Which, you know, ironically, that's, in Luther's, Luther's world, I mean, that, that sounds more like a work, right? you got to work to get your faith right. And, you know, believe in. Well, I was right. I was taught that you know by oh, I, yeah. by my nun, nuns teachers for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> well, it continued because uh, RSV obviously its lineage is the revised version. Other other uh, versions that are popular. Um, that the today's Jerusalem English Bible. version. That's I think that's also called the Living Bible. Uh, the Jerusalem Bible um, used it. Uh, the Catholic New American Bible and Revised Version, also uh, New International Version, which was a reaction to um, the RSV um, by more. Uh, let's see, is that right? Um, NIV was a reaction to. I think it was the RSV. I think it was because the RSV uh, translated the. Uh, Basically, it, it suggested that the, the Isaiah prophecy was that the uh, coming of Christ. Yeah, yeah, that a, a young woman will bear a child versus a virgin will bear a child. And mm. Young woman is is the Hebrew. Mm. The other is a Greek translation from the Septuagint. But but at the end, the NIV was kind of a, re, a bit of a reaction to that. The NRSV at least added the note. So 1990. And this is, I think this is probably the Bible we're reading from, from the pulpit today. Um, it, it at least noted that. But now the, the, um, the Anchor Bible, okay, and that's, that's like, the Anchor Bible is like this, it takes up a shelf this long, and it's, each, each volume is written by a scholar, and, you know, it's got their translation, and it's full of notes. So uh, I don't know who the author of the, uh, the Galatians book is, but... Translates it faith of, and now um, oh, and this is if you don't have a copy of this, the Jewish New Testament is really cool, right? This is written by Jewish scholars, and there's a ton of really great Jewish New Testament scholars, mm -hmm. um, and and they you know choose, and they're not bound by. I mean, almost all these Bibles back to probably you know the, to to the Revised Version were all written by. Um, a consensus group of church people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and even the NRSV, um, th this this would have been wouldn't have been bound by you know previous church. The practice. Jewish one is essentially saying of Jesus. It is, yeah, through through Messiah Yeshua's trusting faithfulness, mm -hmm. yeah, by the faith of Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Messiah is the Hebrew word for Christus. And Yeshua is the Hebrew word for, or Aramaic word for Jesus. Uh, so trusting faithfulness, if we get back to that definition of pistus, trust, faith, trustworthiness, faith, faithfulness. But finally, the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition, which came out last year, 
just comes right out and says, by the faith of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's, uh, Is the new re revised? New revised standard version, updated edition. Updated edition. U-E, yeah. Updated edition. It's a mouthful. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We need to come up with shorter acronyms for yeah. my Bible, so. Um, that, that's, as, that's as many slides as I had for today. And like I said, I was just pinch hitting for, for Bill today. But um, I, I do feel pretty passionate about uh, rescuing Paul from the bad reputation. And, and I've got several Jewish friends, and I feel kind of an acute... I feel, I feel very uncomfortable during Holy Week, frankly, with the way our readings, you know, basically say, the Jews, the Jews, you know, crucify him, crucify him. It's like, no... That never happened, and we've done so much damage to our our, our you know sister in, in the faith. It's just you know. I, mean, I mean the strong feelings against Jews as the killer of Christ. Yeah, that came on pretty early. It didn't. Yeah, wait, but, wait but until the of or in. No, no, it, question. it really came about because of animosity after the destruction of the temple and rivalries and. Group but, one and two got in a pretty bad argument. Yeah, right. Yeah. And but we don't need to make the Jews look bad to make Jesus look good. Jesus looks pretty good, even mm -hmm. to the Jews, right? It's, yeah, I mean, they, when I hear anybody talk in, in any kind of anti-Semitic way, it says, "Hey, Jesus was born and died a Jew." And Paul as His well. His mom and dad were Paul. Jews. Yeah. They keep thrusting yeah. the word "Jew" into yeah. their face. Into their face. Yeah, and if and if we could understand that, I mean, it, I, for me, it just was like mind blowing to realize um, Paul's going back to this promise to Abraham, which was not that the whole world was going to become Jews, but that the Gentiles would turn and worship the God of Israel, and that really became the focus of of Paul's mission, and and it was. Fruitful, right? We know, we know. And, I mean, to the point where Gentile followers began to outnumber Jewish followers probably by the year 100, right? Which created a lot of mm -hmm. animosity and, you know, who's legitimate and who, who really holds the, the, the Jewish ancestry and, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of bad stuff since then. The group one and three animosity, so. So I wonder what, where, like, Paul Paul had kind of progressive approach to things, um, as far as some of, of as far as circumcision and dietary yeah. restrictions and that kind of thing. I wonder, kind of what, where that comes from. Like how how did he arrive at kind of like being able to say, yeah. well, these are more these are the essentials and these no longer are the essentials. Well, I mean, he would, he would, like, is, he, is there a Greek background there where kind of a platonic influence that where spirit is more important than flesh? Or he, 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 he may, one of the groups he's blasting is the Judaizers, as he calls them. And usually they're the group that's coming in to a community he's founded and saying, no, you have to follow the dietary laws, and you men, you have to get circumcised. Right? Mm -hmm. Paul's a Judaizer, right? Because he says... You can't worship idols anymore. You can only worship God, and stop with the weird sex and one, mm -hmm. one other thing. But how, yeah, how did he pick you can't drink those? Blood, you know, you can't th this is the, this is the hill I'm going to die on. These are the things. No idolatry. Um, but yeah, you know, on the on the dietary stuff, you know, you really you even see him kind of soften it, where he says, you know, if it if it's bothering your neighbor, then you know, don't flaunt it, but it's not a big mm -hmm. deal. And even in, in Acts, right, Peter has the dream where the blanket comes down and there's yeah. all the food of the world and it's all good. Right? Lobster, pork, uh, yeah, everything. It was Peter that got that revelation no wonder. Like, yeah. Was there some communication between Peter and Paul where yeah. they both could appreciate what, what the essentials should be? Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah, but that, that's, well, I, I think I'll a little energy into exploring that. How, how, how did Paul decide these things must be adhered to? Right? No worship of idols. Um, and, and well, and other, not just ethics around sexuality stuff, but other, other ethical things too. 
Um, yeah, I wonder if circumcision was ever questioned in other Jewish communities that, along the way, or 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 yeah. not? Did it remain important and essential until Paul? Or well, um, I imagine if you were that that synagogue, the um, the number one donor to building the synagogue was a Gentile God fearer person who came to the to the uh, synagogue regularly and participated in the life of the synagogue, but was also on the city council and probably had to acknowledge, you know, the city's gods and, and mm -hmm. that their uh, um, religious practices. It, it must have created some tension, and yet, obviously, this group was not only welcomed, but, you know, was financially participating in the, in the livelihood of the community. Mm -hmm. Um, since we have just a few minutes, I'd be interested in any suggestions for, we're going to, our planning group is going to meet sometime in the next couple of weeks, three weeks maybe, and start planning for the winter term. Winter. Yeah, so any, any things of interest that anybody would like to, seeds to plant for stuff for us to think about? I, I think we, I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure I have a couple of ideas, I'm just... <clears throat> not thinking very okay, much email. forward right now. Yeah. But, uh, okay, okay. Bring them to you? Yeah, shoot me okay. an email and I'll, I'll bring them to the group. Okay. And I'll, well, I'll copy you when I put the email. I don't know if I have your them. email. Could we? Um, yeah, I'll give it to you. C, tell me when you're ready. C, W, P, C. C is in Craig. C, W. C, W, M, A, S, S, I, E. M, A. M, A. S-S-I-E -S -S -I -E at Comcast.net. Good old Comcast. Good old Comcast, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything you guys would be interested in? Or possibly teaching? <laughs> you were going to do something. Teaching? Sure. I mean, I'd be okay <laughs> teaching something about some of the contemplatives. Yeah. Maybe. That would be cool. Maybe as a prelude to what you're, the book you were talking about, that'd be good. Yeah, that, uh, good. I need to get another copy of that. I had an extra copy I gave to Linda Gelbrick, and then she actually already had it, and so I, actually, I knew mm -hmm. one. She never responded to my email. I asked her if she hadn't given it away, if I could get it back to give to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're familiar with Cynthia Brujol? The, I, I mean, I know of her. Yeah. I, I think you read her. Yeah, yeah. 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 I read one of her books. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've read a couple of her books, but this book on contemplative <clears throat> prayer is one of the most accessible ones I think I've ever read. Um, and she, you know, invokes Thomas Merton and Thomas Keating. In fact, I think she she's done some stuff with Thomas Keating, the Trappist from Colorado. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's um, a big name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll, I'm motivated to email her again and try to track that book down for you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of up to my eyeballs. And I can imagine. Stuff right now, so... Um, don't be in a rush. Okay, no, no, and, and yeah, but we'll have, there's, there's lots of people with lots of things to offer yeah. uh, for next term, next term too. Yeah. And hopefully Bill's back next week right. and we'll do his right. two weeks. Okay. And, and then Elizabeth McCumber's got a couple things, and then I think I'm just going to do one, one week, uh, one of the parables. Um, one of my favorite Jewish... New Testament scholars, Amy Jill Levine. I don't know if you guys are familiar with her. Just on a podcast. Yeah. And, yeah. She self identifies as uh, a liberal, Yankee, unorthodox, Orthodox Jew, New Testament scholar teaching at a Christian divinity school on the buckle of the Bible belt. Uh, she's recently retired, but she was a New Testament professor at Vanderbilt Divinity School, um, which is Tennessee. Methodist? Tennessee. Tennessee, yeah. Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee, the buckle of the Bible Belt. Yeah. She's a big deal. She's really good. She's um, been, uh, she's taught at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome, and and she's wicked funny. If you've heard her podcast, you've heard she's she's got heard her on the great Bible for normal people, I think. But yeah, she's knows, but yeah, she's been yeah. on that podcast, I know, and, yeah. and she's really good. Yeah. But she's got a book called Short Stories by Jesus uh, about mm -hmm. the parables, and 
how, how you know her subtitle is how would the something like I don't think it has a subtitle but it would be how the first hearers of these stories would have likely heard them and how we've kind of over domesticated them and, mm -hmm. and tamed them and they really have a lot punch, more of an edge punch, to them yeah, punch. Than, uh, than you would think yeah <clears throat> All right, well, I see you. you, Kevin. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, hopefully, Bill's here. Yeah, thank you. Release yeah. yeah. back. Thank you, Kurt. That was great. Thank you. Thank you to grab the mugs. Oh, th ah, here, let me move down this. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Did they coog it yesterday? I don't know that I heard there were I, I, I saw a little they were from you. There were two interceptions in the second half oh. against the Cougars. Yeah. That led to he, one of them. I don't think Cam Ward was having the day like we've seen him in all these games up till now. Plus, that Bruin defense looked really tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they got they got some problems on the front line where the Cougs are gonna have to get sorted. Well UCLA is not gonna Get beat by everybody, you know. No. They, 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 but the beans, they had a good game. Yeah, they, they yeah I think good. they did. I think they, they were just, that, and that's you know when it's competitive, one team's down slightly, one team's up slightly, and it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, and missed tackles and uh, an interception at a bad time, and yeah. ga game's over all yeah. of a sudden. Good effort, <coughs> lost. Yeah, I'll, I'll be curious to see how the how the Cougs. Come back. Bounce back after this. Yeah, I, I don't know what their next game is. Cal? I think I think Cal. I don't know. Oh, was uh, is he recording this? Maybe he still is. Better be careful what we say. We might be on. We might be on video. Well, Beavers seemed to woke up, woke up in the second half because I I was listening well, per, well into the second quarter and they were. They were hit seven nothing at the right first first time they got the ball they just scored boom 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 wow. right down the field. I said, Oh boy, it's gonna be a big blowout. Well they scored a lot of points, but they gave up a lot of points. Uh, was uh, that the, was it like fifty two to forty? Was that the Yeah, fifty two like forty one. I mean it was <laughs> a lot of fun, a fun game for people who like <laughs> that story. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it, yeah, now who Who's who? Who's it that's saying the Pac-12 couldn't draw 